Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So we have quite the treat for you this week. Uh, we've had this idea bouncing around for a while to get round tables of sort of really brilliant growers, get them together to talk about a specific subject for our podcast network, which you can and should totally subscribe to. But in this case, we filmed it and we figured we would put up that amazing conversation here for you to listen to and watch. And I even added some of the photos they had of their farms uh, so you could see a little of what they're talking about. Today's conversation is with Helen Atow, David Blanchard, and Lou Johns. These are three amazing growers discussing their living pathway approaches. Uh, there are so many great details in here about how they manage their living pathways to the study and trials that they've done and etc. A uh, big shout out to everyone who has purchased a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com and all of our Patreon members and any other people who have supported us whatever way that you can. That sort of stuff makes all of our work possible, so we really appreciate it. Also, make sure to check out Helen's excellent new book, the Ecological Farm. Now, fair warning, they do discuss tillage and some tillage implements in this video, but you will not find three more ecologically conscious growers than these. And hopefully you can glean some great insight uh, between them and my contributions to help you to see if Living Pathways might be the right for you or some tips on how to do it. So settle in and I hope you enjoy this conversation. everyone, Farmer Jesse here, and I am excited to welcome you all into our first ever No-Till Growers Network Roundtable. Uh, the idea here is that we have gathered together three leaders in the industry, if not downright legends in the industry, to come and chat with us about a very specific ecological farming topic, and that topic today is Living Pathways. And so before we get going, let me quickly introduce our panel. Uh, first up, we have Helen Atow of Woodleaf Farm. Helen is the author of the excellent book, The Ecological Farm, a minimalist, no-till, no-spray, selective weeding, grow-your-own-fertilizer system for organic agriculture. She has a master's degree in horticulture and a long farming history spanning 35 years with farms in Oregon, California, and Montana, where she currently resides. Uh, welcome, Helen. Thank you. Next, we have David Blanchard of Pleasant Hill Farm in Nova Scotia, Canada, where he farms with his wife, Cindy. Their production area consists of roughly an acre of intensive outdoor cropping and seven greenhouses. In addition to over 50 years of practical experience working in agriculture, David has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. Uh, welcome, David. Thanks. Great to be here. And great to have you. Uh, last, we have Mr. Lou Johns. Lou is a retired certified organic vegetable farmer of 35 years at a place called Blue Heron Farm in the Finger Lakes region of New York. For 20 of those years, their fields were managed with permanent beds and living pathways. In fact, though I've had several conversations with Lou, Lou is the one panelist here who has not yet been on the podcast. So an extra special welcome to you, Lou. Thanks. Thanks for putting this on. Yes, and thank you all so much for joining me. Um, and of course, my name is Jesse, and I will be moderating this conversation with production support from Jackson Roulette. Um, all right, so I want to get this started with a discussion of how you all came to using Living Pathways. I know for myself, it was sort of a process of elimination where bare pathways weren't working well enough or were too muddy. Uh, wood chips kept washing out and down our sort of sloped hills um, or onto our beds. The only thing that sort of seemed to work was plants. And so that's what we did. But for you all, I would love to hear how you decided on living path pathways to begin with. Um, and maybe let's start with you, Helen. What led you to those living pathways? Well, it was a happy mistake for me, actually. I had just uh, finished graduate school 40 years ago, and I was, uh, I'd been working for the Integrated Pest Management Program for Rutgers University. And one of the farmers said to me, I'm thinking of transitioning my 200 acre farm to organic 17 crops in one year. Would you help me? And sure, I said, what could go wrong? And, and I learned how to, to figure out 
how to avoid a lot of diseases for crops like tomatoes. And then the next year I went out to do it on my own and he helped me set up all these steak tomatoes. I had about two acres of steak tomatoes and uh, on raised beds, black plastic. And then I couldn't figure out how to cultivate in between them. So I let the weeds grow and I mowed them with a BCS mower and I realized this is brilliant. And I had, I had studied with uh, Masanobu Fukuoka in Japan and I said, ah, maybe we could do this with the kind of cropping we still do uh, in the United States. So it was a mistake and I went on from there. Oh, that's great. Uh, and Helen and I actually talked about her experience working with Masanobu Fukuoka in our original conversation back in 2020. So uh, listeners can, we'll make sure to put links so that listeners can go back and listen to that. Um, what about you, David? How, what was your pathway to Living Pathways? I've always farmed on hills, starting back in the late 1960s, working on somebody else's farm. And so from the beginning, I've had a concern about soil erosion. Uh, my original farming background is not in vegetables, but in uh, dairy and crop farming. And uh, back in the late 60s and 70s, a thing with that type of farm was to divide the fields up into alternating strips where one strip would be a cultivated crop like corn or a small grain and then the next strip would be a sod crop you know clover grass alfalfa whatever and so the farms were uh, my farm uh, was divided into 60 foot wide strips alternating grass and then a cultivated crop and so when we got into vegetables, uh, which we did because uh, dairy farming just wasn't working out for us financially, um, we sort of were interested in the same idea. And actually, what finally really got us going on the permanent path and permanent bed thing was a workshop that we attended uh, either in the late 90s or very early 2000s in Saratoga Springs, New York. And uh, Lou Johns was one of the speakers. And we saw pictures of Blue Heron Farm with those uh, beds uh, alternating with sod pathways. And that was kind of what tipped us over to the edge to say, OK, we could do it when we were dairy and crop farming. We'll do it on a smaller scale with vegetables. And so we've been doing that for, I don't know, 20 some years. We've had permanent beds with sod paths in between. I love that. And I didn't mean to cue you up on the volley there for, for Lou. That was, that was perfect though. Uh, <laughs> so Lou, you know, you helped inspire David. What was your pathway into it? I think the main thing was my concern about compaction, partly from equipment compaction, but also just foot traffic in vegetable production they're just a you know a constant um, mess of foot traffic and tractor traffic that has to happen, and even in my early days of you know clean tillage and using rotivators and yada yada, I always wanted to figure out a way to not walk in the same ground that. I was wanting to grow vegetables in. It just didn't make any sense to me to be walking all over and compacting this ground that, you know, I was trying to create this, you know, nice loose soil to grow crops in. So that was sort of the overriding, you know, uh, interest. But then when we started doing, you know, a slightly bigger operation in upstate New York where we're using bigger tractors and like we literally, and it was all clean tillage, like we were getting where we could see our tire tracks running across, you know, seeded fields like if it wasn't in the same direction, um, you know, from one season to the next. You know, and it was just like <clears throat> our soils in upstate New York were like really heavy, shallow. We didn't have a lot of topsoil. 
heavy clay underlaying everything. So it was pretty sort of a serious issue, like, you know, after about three years or so of clean cultivating and tilling and running tractors over this ground, it was pretty obvious that we had to change things. That was the main impetus to get away from compaction. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so maybe we'll just start right right with you, Lou, and then just go back the other direction. Can you talk about what that transition looked like a little bit? And, and you know, was it just, I'm just going to try and leave these in permanent place and cultivate them? Or were you thinking, I'm going to leave these pathways where they are and then plant them to something? Like what, how did, what, what was the sort of evolution like there? I mean, my thinking all the time about this was always to create permanent planting beds and then figure out how to deal with this issue of getting, you know, permanent walkways established. Uh, But it was always the idea of having the beds stay in place. You know, I mean, it just made sense to me. You know, I don't want to be managing planting ground that I'm fertilizing and trying to deal with weed issues and then move off of that, you know, after a year or two. It's like, you know, there's already enough work to try to get them established. So that's the answer to that one question. But so in establishing, I mean, so we had two fields that we were, when we started this, we had two fields that we had been clean, you know, full width tillage. And it wasn't, I was always an advocate of using rotivators. So I bought a six foot rotivator, an old Howard rotivator, so that I could clean, till my fields behind the wheel tracks of the tractor that I had. It was a 995 David Brown. So when I wanted to switch to permanent beds, I didn't have enough money to buy some new piece of equipment. So we got stuck using six foot beds and then we had to modify the wheel track of the our main tractor the david brown 995 so we had to like spread its wheel track out which was a bit complicated that's another issue to talk about but we did that we got the wheel spacing set up so it would straddle the six-foot rotivator path. And originally, my thinking was, oh, I want to keep these tire tracks, these walkways, sort of as narrow as possible. So I thought, okay, I'll just use a single tire track (coughs) that, you know, the tractor laid down all by itself, and then I would just drive in the same tire track that worked well it didn't work at all i mean it (laughs) it worked but it was much too difficult uh, for various reasons it was hard to stop um, any kind of slight movement and you know not driving straight enough the tiller would sort of walk into the tire track so you know about after the first year, I was like, well, I've got to widen my pathways to accommodate this um, problem with tracking the bed every time. Just to clarify, so you are you were saying like you're going, you're making like a six foot swath and then you were trying to turn directly around, put your wheel right back in that tire track and then go back the other direction. And you realize like that was just a little bit too difficult to navigate. Like it was just yep. getting off in places. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just too, way too narrow. So, you know, it was just this slow progression of like, okay, we'll do two tire tracks. I'll drive, you know, on the outside of the old tire track and just over time, 
again, and it, it was all of it was kind of equipment driven. At, you know, at, as I started to get a feel for doing this, so you know we were stuck with this six foot rotavator, and then once the tire tracks started growing vegetation again after they got it somewhat established. You know, it's like, okay, I got to get a lawn mower or something to get in here and control this vegetative growth. So, you know, like I said, it was just this progression of figuring the whole thing out over time. The biggest sort of thing to for people to realize is that it it's all equipment driven. You know, if your lawnmower is so wide, your tire track's got to be so wide. If your rotivator is four feet wide, then your bed's going to be four feet wide, and, you know, yada, yada. I mean, uh, you know, at some point, I can offer, like, my suggestions for successful <laughs> establishment of, of this routine, but um, for me, it was just an, sort of a constant progression of learning how to get this thing all put together and you know you get a new lawnmower because you got to upgrade because you wipe the old one out with a rock which happened you know like way too many times for me because we had really stony ground and I hadn't figured out how to get the rotivator to keep all the rocks in the bed and Lots of issues came up, but so every time you get a new piece of equipment, then you got to sort of adjust. Right. So effectively you were, you landed on your bed width, which is that six foot. And then you were just deciding your pathways based on the, the, the width of that machinery of your lawnmower. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, and other issues around managing that space, the walks, the walkway itself. Um, and we can dive into that too, a little bit on the, you know, the edging and the, you know, general mowing, what you're doing with that, the, the vegetation and stuff too, in a minute, maybe David, if you want to give us like, what was your sort of transition into actually establishing those pathways and what did that, what did that entail? So we, we started out with an established hay field. And uh, we, using a, a site level and sort of a surveyor's rod, we laid out our beds so that they were level across the slope. And we marked the forefoot width out with the strings and uh, just drove the tractor along the edge of the string and established a bed that way. Uh, we were using a spading machine which is, it's not the ideal machine for busting sod. A, a rotivator is actually better. Uh, and we now have both machines to, uh, and we can get into the reason for that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we, we laid the, the, the beds out with a level and um, marked them out one by one and did the initial tillage on them. Uh, we settled on four feet width because that seemed like the 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 widest width that was reasonably comfortable to reach into the middle of the bed while staying on the sod pathway. Because like Lou, we wanted to confine the wheel tractor from the tractor and all the human foot traffic into those uh, sod pathways to help prevent soil, um, compaction. So yeah, that was, the, that was the basic layout. It was, you know, we just did it one bed at a time, leveled it, marked it with a string, tilled it, moved on. We started at the top of the hill and just moved on down. Uh, we settled on a, a bed length of about 80 feet because our our farm is on the top of a hill. There's a, there's a geological formation in this part of Nova Scotia called a drumlin, which is a, it's a, a, a remnant of when the glaciers came through here. And interestingly, in this part of the world, the good soil is up on top of the hills and the uh, the wet and less productive soils are down in the valleys. So unlike, say, in New England, where the farms are in the valleys and the woods are up on the hills, 
In this part of Nova Scotia, the farms are up on the hills and the valleys in between are pretty much forested. That is wild. That's um, a very, int- I'd lo- yeah, that's yeah. a very interesting geological, uh, it sounds like, yeah, upside down land. Yeah, it is. It's like the farms are islands of agriculture in a sea of forest. And th- this part of Nova Scotia is basically forestry country. There are farms scattered here and there, but it's, uh, you know, like from the boundary of our field in both the northerly direction and the westerly direction, you can go for many, many miles, and it's just all forest. So how did you, well, so I just want to check, when you mean you laid your beds out level, you mean that you kept them on the contour? Exactly. So from end, the, the, the two, from end to end, the bed was level. So in other words, they were laid out across the slope. And then how did you initially decide on your pathway width we decided on that and that's I, I have to tell you that's a subject of some controversy on this farm my wife thinks they should have been wider and uh, she's not wrong we had a limited area in which to lay out our vegetable beds and so um, more paths meant fewer growing beds and when we, so we've been on this particular farm since 2007. And so 16 and a half years ago, we were that much younger and that much more ambitious. So we thought we wanted a whole lot of beds. Uh, we, we originally had 155 outdoor growing beds. Uh, so in order to make that fit in the area where we wanted to, and knowing that we wanted four foot wide beds, to make it work, two feet was about the, the widest we could go on the paths. Um, And then one other consideration was mowing time. You know, the wider the paths are, either it's going to take longer to mow them or you've got to have a bigger machine to mow them with. And um, two feet, so we have a, uh, one of those Berta flail mowers that mounts on the front of a BCS walking tractor, which is two feet wide. And so that was also an incentive to, it was like Lou said, what you decide is partly dependent on the machinery that you already have because few of us have the money to just go out and buy a new machine because yeah. we want it. Yeah, and we use that same uh, Berta mower, uh, but we don't anymore use it in the pathways because it. Um, we got a, a little push mower that has a collector on it, and that's been better for us for our scale, but um, the width of our pathways is only 18 inches, so it's... It works a little better, um, but the pathway is sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm empathizing with Cindy <laughs> because they're not, there's a point at which they just, it feels like they could be really, really big. They could be really, really wide and it would be very nice. But um, right. yeah. We had some friends who laid out their farm with both beds and pathways four feet wide. And their idea was that they would, every three or four years, they would flip so that what was a pathway became a bed. So, so there was, you know, three or four years of sod, and then you seeded down what were the growing beds and you worked up what had been the paths, which is kind of an appealing idea, except that you do accumulate a lot of soil compaction in those pathways, both from wheel traffic and, as Lou said, there's just so much on an intensive vegetable farm, there's just so much foot traffic, you know, for planting, harvesting, weeding, just getting around the farm. People are constantly walking down those pathways. And it, the, the compaction does add up. Did they continue doing the flipping back and forth? They went out of business, so we never got to hear how that... <laughs> well, that uh, doesn't bode well. <laughs> they got discouraged by the, the sheer difficulty of actually making a living, uh, you know, doing this small-scale vegetable farming. Yes, indeed. Um, Helen, do you want to give us your rundown on how that, how that sort of establishment phase went for you? You bet. You've Actually, done it in a few different ways. I, I have. I was going to say my, uh, my systems have evolved over the last 35 years of, of actually doing my own farms from a, an annual system with a closer, about two foot, four foot beds and two foot uh, row middles, walkways, to actually I did the four foot middles and the four foot beds and it was evolution based on what uh, what my ecological knowledge 
how my ecological knowledge developed. And also, I'm going to say the same thing as David and Lou, uh, equipment. I, I didn't want to buy new equipment to do anything. And I think that was a smart way to stay in business, by the way. And I, I, um, I evolved. So I started out uh, in Montana in the early 90s with a system that I, uh, where I tilled the whole field every year and then I made my beds and reseeded my living mulches in the pathways. And I had a four foot bed maker, so that, that was gonna be my, you know, my, my beds were gonna be four foot raised beds. For, for everything. Some were plastic covered uh, for uh, solanaceous crops in Montana, and some were not plastic, but everything was a four foot bed. And then I had a water wheel transplanter that would fit those four, you know, that's how you do it. Your equipment all fits with what you had. So I started out with these two foot wide living mulches in between the four foot beds. And I had a BCS uh, uh, sickle bar mower. And that was kind of neat because it would, it would tilt and I could do the edges of the beds. A little problematic with a plastic bed, but we won't talk about that. There was sometimes bad language, but worked really well where there was no plastic for tilting and, uh, and, uh, and doing those two inch, um, I'm sorry, those uh, two foot row metals. Uh, but then over time, I began to see the advantages of, of not tilling the whole field. And so I started leaving islands of untilled areas and farming around that and eventually moved to a new field uh, that was six acres, still doing the two acre field. And I felt that I had more room and I was feeling rich, so I bought uh, another tractor, a, a cute little uh, Yanmar uh, tractor and a 48 inch mower. And I said, aha, I can now do four foot beds and four foot living mulches. And uh, that's what we did for the last, uh, last years on my farm in Montana. Then I married a brilliant man who was doing this since the 1980s in his orchard and with small vegetable production. And that was on hilly ground, David. So I understand, uh, I understand how vital it was to have these living mulches on heavier soils and hilly ground. Um, and we then did uh, the wide, uh, the wider spacing in between the vegetable rows, or we did smaller spacing and we trellised things like cucumbers uh, so that things would go up. And then finally in Oregon, uh, we were feeling really wealthy and semi-retired. So we, we really wanted to push the ecological envelope and we went into, a, we had 200 acres, 70 irrigated acres, and it was all hay. So we said, what would it be like if we really did no till and we just strip tilled in between the, the hay field? And, and that's what we did. But at that point, we had realized how lovely it is to uh, sit on a piece of equipment rather than pushing the BCS mower and we were getting older. So we designed everything around uh, around these wider living room middles. Uh, but we went from using legumes uh, that were quite manageable to this uh, hay field. Um, and I say that loosely, it was grasses, legumes, clovers and alfalfa and forbs, uh, which other people might call weeds. And that uh, took quite a bit of ecological wisdom to manage. So those are the three systems. And now I'm back in Montana with, uh, with five acres of alfalfa. So I'm learning a whole new way of, uh, clearly my living mulches are going to uh, be alfalfa because I no longer till the field up when I begin a new farm. And um, that has had um, some new challenges that I could tell you about. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that sounds, uh, that I, I can imagine there are some challenges with having in an alfalfa field. Um, but questions that I have actually kind of 
to to keep the conversation on the mowing stuff um because you've done some work on this helen with the differences between mowing and putting the mulch straight down so more like a flail mower or something like that versus putting it onto the bed tops um because I know that you did a study, you write about it in your book. We talked about it in our last app, ep, in our conversation back in 2020. Um, I'm curious, you maybe just touch on that, but also what was that sort of evolution like? Was it just a product of the machinery that you were using, like in terms of what you were mowing with and how you were mowing? Uh, yes, partially equipment based and partially my understanding of how to get nutrients to cycle most rapidly which is uh, a, an an issue for all of us organic farmers but especially those of us in northern climates it was not so much an issue in california but in montana and in eastern oregon where we need to get our nutrients cycling rapidly enough that we will have uh, nutrients getting to our crops and early yields. So based on that, I, I, did, I was working at how to get optimum decomposition and deal with surface applied residues, doing less and less tillage, and so how to get my fertilization through that. So my mowing began to multitask as weed suppression and also making it easy for us to work and and also how do i grow my own fertilizer how does this work as as a big part of my nutrient cycling so um, i started mowing and blowing residues into the beds i i did I'm not, actually, I won't go through all of the different experiments. We do quite a bit of on-farm experimenting, looking at very shallow tillage in between the rows, um, like perhaps a, a power harrow, just going down a, an inch and a half, two inches, versus real cultivation and leaving the soil bare in between, versus living mulch, mulch mowed and left on the surface and living mulch and mowed and thrown into the beds. And Lou, I, I had the same experience you did when we looked at what happened when we tilled in between those beds. I was just shocked at how compacted and diminished the soil tilth and health could be when, when with that experiment where one of the treatments was tilling in between. So we, we never went back there. Uh, but we did learn how to use the residues on the beds and the last farm in eastern Oregon uh, we were able to do quite a bit of um, grow your own fertilizer experiments and I, I do talk about that in minute detail in the book but here I want to say that we found that uh, excitingly enough with the wider at least four foot row middles we were able to mow the living mulch selectively, leaving some for habitat for beneficial organisms, but we were able to blow that periodically throughout the season onto the beds. And um, for some crops, that was all the fertilization that we applied, while for other beds, we did both the living mulch and we applied uh, an, another four inches of mulch collected from another part of the hay field uh, on another part of the farm. And uh, I'm really excited by that so that the mowing of the living mulches began to multitask as habitat creation for beneficial organisms and also for uh, nutrient cycling and fertility management. So that that basically has been the evolution and the progression uh, and I, I just want to say that the reason that we evolved in that direction is that as lou and david know taking larger areas out of production and putting them into living mulches i've got to make them have more ecological function than just footpaths because i'm i'm diminishing my yield per acre by having larger 
row middles and pathways, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that a lot of us, I think about it all the time. And I'm curious to hear, uh, you know, for us, we've been collecting, like I said, we've been collecting the mulch now from the pathways and then taking that to com- to the compost piles, our nitrogen source. Um, and then, you know, addressing some of that ecological, uh, you know, uh, de- deficiency or whatever you would call it, where you're losing that space. We've been using a lot more flowers and clovers and that sort of stuff to get more beneficials in there as well, uh, which is also something we can discuss. Um, David, I'm curious how that sort of resonates with you. Have you done any, what your thoughts are on mowing, uh, putting it in the beds, putting it down? Like what have your experiences with that been? A lot of our production is leafy greens and blowing uh, chopped mulch onto leafy greens is a disaster. When it, I mean, when you get to the, to the wash station, uh, you really regret it. So uh, we have done some mowing and blowing in the past, but now we just put it all straight down into the pathways. And we too are interested in growing as much of our own fertility as possible. We have about 10 acres of pasture slash hay field. Uh, we do intensive pasturing of poultry there. And when the grass gets ahead of the poultry, which it will do like in June, it's uh, because it's just growing faster than we can move the poultry along, uh, then we bale that into hay and we do that ourselves. And by making hay in June, in our part of the world, in June, there is essentially zero mature weed seed in hay that's cut in June because the grass doesn't really start growing until the middle of May. And so it's not until sometime in July that you actually start getting seed. And, of course, um, seed, weed seeds in hay mulch, that's the objection I always hear to using uh, mulch for hay. But if you if you make it yourself so you know uh, the provenance of it, uh, it can work really well. And also hay that is cut in June around here has a lot of feed value. And we always say that if it would be good food for a cow, it's also really good food for soil microbes. So by using, baling that hay in the hay field and then using it as mulch on our growing beds, we're sort of transferring some fertility from the hay field into the growing beds. And of course, the mulch also suppresses weeds and uh, reduces evapotranspiration, so it saves us water. And then to sort of close the loop, the organic grain that we're um, buying to supplement the the chickens because the um, modern laying hands can't even come close to meeting their nutritional needs just foraging on pasture. They can take a dent out of that expensive organic grain bill, but you're still buying grain in. So that is the source of nutrients that's coming onto the farm. We run it through the chickens. They deposit it as manure on the field. And so that sort of replenishes the nutrients that we removed in hay and transferred into our growing beds. So that's sort of, it doesn't always work out. Like this year uh, in June, we basically lost the month of June for field work. Uh, It rained 24 out of the 30 days in June. And a lot of those days we got like 25 or 30 millimeters per day. So June was pretty much of a washout and we weren't able to make the quality of hay that we want to this year. But usually we uh, we can do it. We can fit it in in June. Yeah, that um, the leafy greens thing resonates with me as well, just because the uh, that's a lot of what we grow too, and that's why we started collecting. Even when we were putting it down, we'd find that sometimes if we didn't have the bag on the back of our little push mower, uh, it would shoot out into the greens anyway. So we actually kind of just became practical for us to start collecting it, um, and then we put it in a wheelbarrow, take that wheelbarrow to the compost pile, which is not my favorite thing. I'd rather just do less work there, but also we're we're at a loss for good nitrogen sources. So it's a little bit of, you know, uh, give and take, and it just comes right back to the garden. So I don't feel too bad about that. Um, and the photosynthesis helps us to replenish it. Um, but n- Lou, I'm curious what your uh, experiences are or have been with that, with mowing, whether you're putting it on the bed tops or putting it straight down. So this goes back to uh, walkway width. Uh, what I always suggest to people is that you make your walkways wide enough so that your whatever you're mowing with 
Um, your walkway is maybe a third wider, right? So that your walkway is wider than your mower. And it's for a couple of things. And so this issue around leafy greens and should I, can I mow stuff onto them? And, or can I, what do I do if I can't? One thing that always surprised me, because we used to grow a lot of leafy greens, beet greens, spinach, lettuce, and all this stuff. Um, direct seeded, primarily lettuce was transplanted. Um, so for direct seeded greens, like I found that I could go and mow walkways and blow clippings onto spinach that was maybe, you know, an inch, inch and a half tall, way before harvest. And, you know, I wouldn't like be completely covering them over with clippings, but what I learned is that they were fine. They would just grow up through it. So then the other reason to have this extra space for your mower. Um, one of the things, two things you can do by having more width um, is like for, so I would mow down my walkways next to these direct seeded greens. And then I wouldn't mow onto that bed again until I had harvested. So the next time I needed to mow, I'd either mulch it or I'd mow it onto the bed next, my other bed next to it. And it, which would be planted into something different. Ideally, not always, it might be two beds of spinach next to each other. But you can, in, you know, in a smaller scale, you can arrange your beds so that they don't have the same crop in them. So it just lets you move material the other way. And you get around this issue of like, oh my God, what do I do with all these clippings? It lets you, you know, put them on to the other bed. The other thing is, is you can come back later, like if you have this extra bit of um, walkway growth in your uh, side discharging, you can mow into that extra growth on your, say the second time you want to mow around your spinach instead of blowing it into the bed, you can blow it into that extra growth that's sitting there and just let it catch it. And, you know, so even if you had another bed of spinach next to it. So there are ways to deal with. But, so, we primarily put clippings into the bed. And then if we had, you know, if you're talking about like a broccoli planting, you could just put clippings in there all day long, you know, any time of the season without disturbing the crop. So it was almost always um, the taller crops that were transplanted, they could all take clippings. So that's interesting. And I think that point, one, the point about timing makes a lot of sense, right? A lot of times we're not getting, especially in the summertime for us, we get really hot, so we're not getting second cuttings of lettuce or something. In fact, putting those that mowed clippings on the bed and then, uh, you know, just mowing our the remainder of the lettuce, the, how we usually terminate it anyway, um, would is beneficial and would be beneficial. Uh, so that's a matter of timing. But I like that. I think that just so maybe the listeners have it, what you're talking about is you have these beds, these pathways rather, that are wider than your mower and you're mowing down the middle and you're leaving kind of two small growths, like uh, strips against on either side of that mode area. And then you're mowing and it's hitting that taller stuff that you left. 
So it's not hitting into the bed in some cases. That's kind of what you were describing? Well, that would, that would be one possibility, yes. The other is <clears throat> taking the, the whole width and putting it onto the bed next to your mower and then leaving that other third to deal with, to do that idea of having a catch for if you had to mow a second time before you harvest the spinach. But you could, you know, the way you just suggested, that's another option when you have this extra space. So, yeah, you can use it as a catch. And then, you know, you come back later after you've harvested the bed and you move all that material onto the bed. Um, yeah, you know, there's just all all sorts of things to do. But I guess I'm always... In, Generally encouraging people to go for a slightly wider walk. I'm so excited by what they're saying because, of course, this is exactly what we've evolved to. And, and one of the reasons that we have the wider beds, but I think it's really key to, to fit this all into your rotation, understanding timing, understanding carbon to nitrogen ratios of the residues that you're putting on. And so, for example, with salad greens, um, they're only a part of our rotation. And like Lou, we have the other beds that we can mow things onto while the salad greens are not being mowed into. But very excitingly, we leave some of that, that area of unno unmowed habitat. So you can mow into the unmowed habitat. You get carabid beetles and row beetles and spiders in that area, as well as the bloom. But then later on, when you're flipping that lettuce bed, then you let everything grow close and you finally mow that stuff onto the bed before you flip it. Because one of my new rules the last 10 years is that we never, never till unless we're adding residue. So we never cultivate, we never till unless we're doing that. And it's exciting to me to hear that David and uh, Lou are, are figuring out that this timing issue and fitting it into your, your crop rotation so that the way you mow is different for different crops and different beds and whether you're flipping it and whether it's a heavy feeder that needs all that residue or one that doesn't. Uh, uh, this is all the details I think that matter. Yeah, I agree. And it has me thinking that I need to find like a 10 inch mower so that I can, my little 18 inch pathways, I can have a little strip. Exactly. In, in fact, one thing that I was thinking, <laughs> one thing I was thinking was the, um, you know, just that I, when I first started doing our pathways, my impulse was to mow, 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 mow. Was just like, keep it short, keep it clean. And what I did this past year was the opposite. And I basically just started letting it grow because what I was realizing was how lush they were getting because they're getting residual compost and stuff from the, from the beds. Um, so they're getting really lush and they're, they're putting roots down a lot further um, and reducing the compaction layer or the compaction in the pathways if I'm allowing them to grow. And I just realized like how many more insects were in there and how many more flowers, um, how much more ecology was going on in, in general. Um, and what and I'm curious, it does come with challenges though when you start allowing it to get taller. Challenges in harvest, challenges in uh, you know, uh, you know, getting into the bed, uh, like not seeing it creep into the beds and those, those sorts of things. I'm curious, maybe we'll just uh go back to you, Lou, and we'll start back the other direction. Um, challenges with this system for you, like what were some of the biggest challenges in, in navigating how to manage these? pathways and keep them from getting into your beds and and it's in some cases maybe even like creeping the pathways creeping out a little bit and starting to to devour the beds um what were your challenges there uh well everybody will laugh i'm sure uh, just keeping up with <laughs> all of the tasks on the farm and having walkways that need mowing, especially in the spring, just adds to the whole issue of keeping up with this rank spring growth. So, you know, and as you were mentioning, Jess, you know, as the summer progresses, 
that growth slows down, so it becomes less of an issue. Um, so I want to um, just touch on a couple things, and I'll try to address some of these issues of challenges. So just so people understand, um, our farm, we were generally planting and, you know, managing about 12 acres of vegetables in this setup. And we had like 15 acres of managed fields that also, you know, were involved with beds and uh, walkways. But we we're planting and cultivating on about 12 acres. So in terms of this idea of mowing walkways and the timing and um, insect habitat and all of this. Like, there was never a time on this 12 acres where all the walkways were getting mowed at the same time. So we always had, there was always, you know, unmowed, walkway growth going on all over the farm, uh, very, you know, all throughout the season. So we had, you know, beneficial uh, insect and spider habitat, like, all the time that was undisturbed. So, you know, it was just sort of to address that uh, point that Helen was bringing up of, like, you don't want to wipe out all of that habitat all at once. So that wasn't going on on our farm. Um, it, and just to give people context for our operation, you know, we had our beds were managed with a rotavator and were clean tilled with additions of generally poultry compost uh, on a, maybe every other year we were adding additional fertility onto the beds. But for um, planting purposes, everything was done on, you know, tilled ground. Um, so this issue of how do you deal with this intentional growth that you've, you know, allowed to happen next to your planting bed, how do you deal with, you know, what uh, seems like, oh my God, all the quack grass that's in my walkways, it's just going to grow into my beds and it's going to be a nightmare or every other you know, plant and weeds going to establish into my planting beds. So a couple things that address that for us. One is that we were tilling with the rotavator in our beds anywhere from, you know, two to three times a season for preparation or terminating a crop and preparing it for a second planting or cover cropping in the fall sort of affair or summertime cover cropping. But the other thing I did is on all of my cultivating tractors, I had small spider gangs, either like a single spider rolling coulter or um, multiple spider gangs. I used, um, I scab li Lilliston cultivators off of an old set of Lilliston cultivators that I had <clears throat> that had really nice little two two spider gangs that I used. So every time I cultivated crops, um, and again, I was a clean 
um, middles cultivator in between the planted rows on our six foot bed. I made an attempt with cultivated tools to keep those middles clean. I was, you know, it was not always perfect, but just to give people an idea of how we ran the operation. So every time I did cultivation, I was picking at the edge of the walkway and, you know, just doing a slight tillage and cultivating that edge. So we rarely had problems with weeds and, you know, rhizominous weeds like quackgrass, which we had a ton of in our walkways, um, migrating into the bed wasn't an issue. So in, in some settings, we would find that we'd have um, dandelions that would establish themselves right on the the edge of the walkway, you know, at that margin between the bed and the, the walkway. It was kind of interesting, you know, is just because they have a really long, deep tap root and they're perennial, and the, if the tiller just, you know, scuffed them a little bit, they didn't care, they just keep growing. So that it was kind of interesting, you know, in some places we had just this permanent um, row of dandelions hanging out at the edge and was that with the dandelions was that a did you view that as a benefit or a negative thing or well like there's lots of benefits from dandelions when they're the earliest um flower in the spring for bee you know bee uh food source not you know both nectar and pollen so they're really important um, they have this big, long, deep tap root, and they're bringing up nutrients all the time and putting in their leaf growth, and then we're taking and mowing that off and putting it in the bed. So, um, you know, it's this constant sort of pumping action that they're doing. I mean, it's, it's the same thing's happening with all of your plant growth that's going on in your walkway is they're bringing up nutrients and you're moving it into your beds, um, or you should be, um, you can be. Um, what were some of the other challenges? Well, uh, this other thing about cultivating and having these little spider gangs on the, so realize those were running behind the, the tires. Like on most cultivating tractors, what you have is track erasers running behind your tires. But so on mine, the rear cultivating uh, bars had these little spiders that ran just at the edge of the bed, just inside the tire track. Um, and they kind of look like a wheel with like legs coming off of them, right? And they spin? Yep. Do they spin or do no, they? They're, they're yeah, little rolling coulters, spin. like a disc, yeah. you know, but they're, they have fingers on them instead of a solid disc. But the Lillistons, they were different, but um, it's another conversation. <laughs> but uh, what I was sort of getting towards is that in all of that working, I'm for me anyway, I was moving all these stones back into the bed because for me, my biggest challenge was keeping rocks out of the walkway because they destroyed lawnmowers. And um, that's mostly because I was originally using little gasoline lawnmowers where the blade is attached to the crankshaft of the mower. And it's not not a good deal to hit a rock because you usually just throw the mower away and go get another one. So that got expensive <laughs> and tiring and, you know, so. 
but I I did finally figure out how to um, shield my tiller so that it kept all the material underneath the hood of the tiller. It took a while to figure it out, but I finally figured it out. And I finally, I did, I finally found, I never bought one because I couldn't afford it, or at least, um, and they weren't available. I finally found the ideal tiller to do bed. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to do tillage, I did find the ideal tiller for doing this stuff. So we can talk about sure. that. Later. Well, yeah, you got to tell us what it is now. You really tell us. <laughs> oh, what is it? Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's a, a tiller made by the company Amantis, who makes, it's one of the sort of common spader companies, Amantis. They're, where are they? They're Italy. Uh, and there's a importer on the East Coast but they make a rototiller that is designed the same way as the BCS machines are, where it's a center drive. And there's, so there's no, but the problem for me forever was that it's almost all rotivators and some spaders all have this chain or gear drive box on one side. And so you have this big skid underneath the drive box for your tiller that you have to decide, like, is that going to be in the bed or is that going to be the skid going to be running on the walkway? If it's running on the walkway, it's you know, it's keeping your tiller so it can't work very deeply. It's always limited by that skid, or the skid is tearing up the edge of the walkway all the time. So this tiller has no drive box on the outside. Its drive box is in the middle, just like the BCS and the old Troy builds and stuff. And then there's two shafts that go out from the middle that carry all the um, tilling knives. And then on, on the Amantis machine, it has two heavy-duty carrier bearings that ride on the, out, the two outside shields. So it's a very well-made machine. And then it, so what's that? What that's doing, you know, you just, all you have is your outside shields. They're at the edge of the machine. There's nothing hanging on the outside, tearing things up. And then the Amantis, um, this tiller, comes with a, a roller that runs behind the deck. And it's all, the shielding is, they, you know, set it up like I figured out how to do my uh, I had a coon tiller, six foot, so that the the back deck rides inside the outside shields. So everything stays inside and underneath the machine, and then it's got this really nice roller cage that runs behind it. So it's like ideal. I helped a a young farmer in Pennsylvania set up her operation with um, that tiller. And it was, it was beautiful. And it, you can set it up so you have really nice depth control. So it's a machine that could be used to manage like very shallow tillage work and just keeping everything really clean and neat. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's it's interesting to find like the right, you know, tools that that fit the job. You know, for us like um I always say that I want a mower that has an edger on it already. Like I just need a mower edger. Like I I 
doing mowing and I'm doing edging on our farm. We're not doing any tillage in our beds. So we don't have that option of having the tiller be the edger. Um, but I need a mower that will do the edging at the same time. But I don't know if that would actually be ideal because sometimes our pathways move a little bit. Uh, but the, you know, for us, like having something, having an edger that's a little bit wider would be nice with almost like a full tine on it instead of like a sharp, all edgers are like sharp blades. I want something that's got a hook on it to either drag some of that out as it goes, like kind of slowly or to kind of just give me, you know, a half inch or an inch of tillage right there on that edge to just break those rhizomes and stuff up a little bit. And then we usually, when we're clearing a bed, we clear the whole thing. So that's never an issue. Um, but it can be in situ when I'm trying to grow a long season crop be an issue. Um, but David, I kind of want to hear some of your thoughts on this, on challenges and, and development and those sorts of things. Sure. Uh, we tend to keep the growth in our pathways on the longish side, uh, partly because uh, that makes them more effective for erosion control. And also, uh, as has been mentioned, it's good habitat for beneficial insects. And the fewer times a year we mow them, uh, the less work it is, which is also a good thing. Uh, the one place where we do keep the beds pretty short is, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're pretty much surrounded by forests, and we have got a ton of wildlife around the farm, everything from bears and bobcats to uh, field mice and voles. And the field mice and voles are a problem in our carrots and beets because, you know, those root crops where the top typically pops out of the ground a little bit, the mice and voles love to come along and chew on them. And uh, those gnawed beets and gnawed carrots are not particularly saleable. Uh, we also have a lot of hawks around here, and their main prey is small rodents like mice and voles. And the mice and voles like, they don't like to leave cover. So they love long grass and pathways because they feel safe. So when the garret, carrots and beets are starting to pop a little bit, we do try to keep the paths adjacent to those beds mowed like lawn short, uh, just because it, discu it discourages those small rodents from breaking cover and getting into the growing beds and chewing on our beets and carrots. Probably the biggest problem related to our, our grassed beds, our grass pathways, other than the mice and voles, is slugs and wireworms. Uh, wireworms are a huge problem for basically all root crops in this part of the world. And I think they're, they seem to become becoming a bigger problem as time goes on. Maybe that's related to climate change. Our winters are certainly much, much milder than they used to be. Um, but anyway, wireworms thrive in sod. And so our sod pathways are kind of a reservoir for for pests like slugs and wireworms, as well as a reservoir for, you know, mycorrhizal fungi, carabid beetles, all kinds of good things. Uh, so on balance, we're, you know, we're sticking with the paths for sure. Uh, we are experimenting quite a lot with uh, wireworm suppressing cover crops that we grow before root crops like carrots, beets, garlic, onions that are sus potatoes that are susceptible to wireworm damage. And the two that are working pretty well for us are buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat is, is, it's not toxic to wireworms, but there's some sort of nutritional deficiency in it. So the wireworms feed on the buckwheat roots, but they don't thrive. And so their populations, uh, if, if not decline, at least they don't explode because it's an unfavorable food for them. And then the, uh, the mustard is actually toxic to uh, um, to wireworms, but only when it's worked into the soil. So with our, our mustard-covered crops, we flail mow them and then immediately till them in. Uh, and then we'll plant things like garlic, onions, potatoes. Uh, and really, after flail, when you're flail mowing the mustard, it, it'll make your eyes burn. <laughs> but it, it, you know, we, ha we haven't done a properly controlled and replicated trial, but just based on our experience and observations, we do think it's helping with the wireworms. And this work, this was inspired by some real experimental work that was done over on Prince Edward Island, where they grow a, a lot of potatoes. 
and wireworms are a huge problem. Even for conventional potato growers, there are not a lot of insecticides that are very effective on them. Uh, so they, they, that's where this work on the buckwheat and the mustard was originally done, and we've just sort of adapted it to our small-scale farm. And in terms of uh, control, <coughs> excuse me, controlling the edges, uh, we are not a strict no-till farm. We're a minimum tillage farm. We, we think long and hard before doing tillage on a given bed. There's got to be a good reason for it. We completely avoid what we call cosmetic tillage, which is tillage that you do just so the farm looks nice with no weeds in sight. Uh, we're fine with weeds growing in the beds as long as they're smaller than the crop and they're not going to go to seed before, uh, before they get terminated when the crop is done. Uh, I actually love to see a, a, car, a sort of a thin, spotty carpet of weeds in between you know, a crop that's much bigger than the weeds are because they're really not a threat and they're sort of a, you know, a, a, a grow-in-place cover crop. We're also experimenting with intentional sort of cover crop, inner crops in our growing beds. Uh, honestly, we're finding that to be pretty challenging, but it's our goal is definitely to keep the soil covered as much as possible and to have that cover be something that's living as opposed to something that, that's dead like a hay mulch. Uh, and we're pretty plastic averse, so um, we don't use any uh, plastic film for mulch. We do use some landscape fabric on our winter squash crop because our summers here can be quite cool and wet and we find that to get the squash matured before we get frost in early to mid-September, uh, the landscape fabric helps. At least that's something that we can reuse, you know, year after year after year, as opposed to a, a plastic mulch film. Has anybody, I'm curious if anyone, any one of you can answer this too, in comparison to other management practices, did you see a reduction in the amount of labor going towards pathways? As opposed to like just clean tillage of a whole area and then solid planting that? Sure. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for us, for instance, um, oftentimes we kept our path, our beds permanent, but our pathways mm. bare. So that took a mm -hmm. lot of cultivation for those spaces. Um, you know, uh, or another example would be when we started using wood chips and we are, you know, measuring the amount of work that would go into, you know, keeping those clean and keeping those mulched versus hand weeding or hand cultivating, um, or in this case now mowing. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or was there anything that you found like, oh, this is actually saving me time or, oh, this is costing me a little time, but I feel like the benefits are greater. I, I, sus I haven't done, you know, again, a proper study on this, but my gut feeling is that mowing the pathways a few times per season is less work than dealing with bare soil pathways. Um, but again, even if it turned out that it were more work, we would stick with them again because we're farming some pretty steep slopes. I mean, so, um, the steeper parts of our farm are like 8% slopes. So that means in 100 feet of horizontal tra um, travel, the ground drops eight feet. And that's, you know, that's a significant uh, slope. And it's our, we're on a sandy loam soil, which is highly erodible. So we're really, we're, we're set up for soil erosion. Uh, if, if we were doing clean cultivation, erosion would be a huge problem for us. And uh, our, our, bed, our, our path system really got put to the test, uh, especially this past June, which, as I mentioned, we had a tremendous amount of rain and some really heavy rains. And from the beginning of June onward, our, our year has been really wet. Like we're up to 1,700 millimeters of rain uh, so far this year. Uh, 100 millimeters is four inches. So just to put it in context, that's what almost 70 inches of rain. Our long-term average is more like 40, maybe 45 inches of rain. Uh, some some farming colleagues in the area who don't have uh, permanent pathways had some real serious erosion blowouts 
this year. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I really don't think that the that the the grass pathways are more work than uh, clean cultivated pathways would be, and they might even be a bit less. I I agree with that, and I also feel like maybe when I was mowing them really tight that's when I felt like I was, they were taking a lot of labor. Um, now that I'm allowing them to grow a little longer, uh, to much longer, really. Um, they don't seem, it's, it's barely, it doesn't, it does, it's like once a month project, maybe, uh, even in the dead heat of summer. So, um, depending on how wet we are and, and those sorts of things, but the, there is an element to it that I think would be interesting. Maybe Helen could touch on this. Um, the wildness factor, because you go from, and you were talking about this a second ago, David, um, you know, allowing maybe for a little bit more weed pressure around your plants just to have those living roots. There is an element that goes from that, like clean, cultivated, pristine sort of look to allowing in this, this greater element of wildness. Um, what has, uh, and maybe start with you, Helen, is there, do you have thoughts on that or was there a transition for you or a was it just sort of kind of from the beginning, this felt good? Uh, yes, when I first started in the early 90s using the, the clover living mulches, I, uh, uh, the only reason I mowed them was to, uh, to, to keep it looking, <laughs> I guess I'm gonna have to say, just to keep it looking neat, but also to make it easier to walk in. Nobody likes to harvest in tall things, but, but you know, uh, the lovely thing about uh, what we've evolved to now is that I don't need much labor. Um, I, I, I stopped doing most uh, hand weeding, I just do some selective weeding. So uh, it's just me mainly that has to deal with the living mulches and, and we have less complaints. <laughs> but but I, I, I did want to uh, say that, yes, uh, we've looked into the economics a little bit and uh, timing again is key not mowing everything all at once, but mowing where you need to, mowing quite close in the spring when you have uh, a competitive uh, uh, moving in from the living mulch or shading or cooling or vole habitat. Uh, I, I too have dealt with voles. Um, and then not mowing later on or at different times or with different crops, brassicas, for example, uh, can handle tall living mulch next to it quite easily, whereas um, my seeded lettuce and my onions, I don't want, um, uh, and some of the other root crops. So again, timing crop specific in, in terms of which pests are, are part of your ecological system and, and, and mowing can cool crops or, and that could be good with my lettuce, for example, and my spinach that I'm trying to get late in the summer, but not good with other things. So long story for me is that we usually do uh, about four mowings a year and um, uh, most of it early in the season, uh, and then one, uh, depending on the crops, uh, a, a late cleanup mowing. And we figured it was, uh, Carl calculated, my late husband calculated about 10 gallons per acre of uh, diesel to get that done. And the amount that we were saving uh, in terms of cultivation um, was, was about uh, equivalent. Uh, so um, I'm, I, I didn't, I think, tell you what my, my challenges were with this system. So can I, can I mention that? So um, uh, like David, uh, I have not been a, a zero weed tolerant uh, system ever with the legumes uh, in between the crop rows in the 90s. Uh, very little weed problems and and very little uh, cultivation and and hand weeding for about the first five years and then grasses started moving into the legumes as they will do and hence that was the time to then flip the the living mulches became the beds and the beds were then reseeded in the Oregon farm where we went straight into pasture, we've had these rhizomatous grasses to deal with. So the system had to change uh, again with um, 
uh, with certain crops requiring more mowing in the early spring right next to them to keep the rhizomatous grasses and some of the perennial weeds in check to suppress them until the crop root system got established. And, and what I started doing uh, had a three foot uh, a rotavator and uh, Lou, I know exactly what you're talking about. There was, and I used it as part of my system actually, so that where the where the tiller kind of made that that little compacted area was the edge of the bed. But I also then started coming in with a, a ripper. Uh, with uh, what I call my, my single shank chisel plow. And I would rip down and rip back early in the season because the rhizomatous grasses would by the fall have started to move into my bed. And then in the fall, they would, they would between the crops and the, the, the weeds moving in and the rhizomatous grasses, they would cover my bed. So I stopped having to cover crop. And I said, oh, well, this is interesting. Can I work around that with my equipment? And so then in the spring, before I would do the shallow tillage, I would come through and rip down and rip up. And of course, I have a cold and dry climate, so I would expose those rhizomes to the surface and, um, and you know, and actually just pull them to the end of the, uh, the 400 foot beds. And then I would let them dry out. And then I would go through and mow my very young, succulent, um, lower carbon to nitrogen ratio residues, my higher nitrogen residues early in the spring, throw them in the bed, and then I would rotivate them uh, in. So again, the timing became really vital if I was going to utilize the problem of the rhizomatous grasses moving into the beds and and utilize that as, as cover. And it turned out, Lou, you're going to laugh, that... Um, like the mustards can be very suppressive and some of the rye grasses can be suppressive of certain diseases and wire worms and nematodes. Well, it turns out quack grass roots can be too. It, there is some interesting study. So utilizing those, and again, uh, like David, I am not, uh, I am not a minimum t or I'm not no till I am minimal till but I try to utilize tillage as part of my nutrient cy cycling system so did I answer the questions I kind of got off on a tangent I've, I've been listening to Lou and David and uh, it's making me think about my system uh, no I love it you you did and I'm glad that you mentioned uh challenges there because uh, I had neglected to get to you on that question so I appreciate that you that you came back to it um before we go, is there, yeah, Lou, is there, I'm, I'm curious just in general, like what you all, um, if there's anything else that you think is, is really critical to add to the, to the sort of topic of, I know this is a conversation I think we could have for a very long time because we didn't really talk about things like, uh, you know, crop selection. If there's specific stuff you're wanting to sow in there too much. Um, we talked a little bit about the mustards and the buckwheat and that sort of stuff for the wireworms, but, um, you know, those sorts of questions of, you know, uh, is there anything else that we should add that, that you feel like is really critical? Well, it's, it, I was only uh, coming back to the question of advantages that we may have found, um, you know, or weighing, like, are we spending more time? Is, do we, are there benefits to having walkways? So on our operation, we used... Um, Overhead irrigation, solid set aluminum piping for all of our watering needs. Um, and one of the big benefits of having permanent walkways is your ability to manage um, moving and setting up irrigation without having to worry about, like, walking into muddy fields to get your pipes out and, you know, just making a complete mess just to get your pipes out because you need to move them. Or at least that's how our system was. We, you know, we had like 
one set of pipes for each one of our three main fields. So it meant, you know, when we were in a drought setting, it was, you know, it was a, um, I always <clears throat> refer to it as like trying to put out a forest fire. You know, so it was like we were needing to move pipe. Like as soon as the one set went down, we had to get it moved right after the water went off. And with living pathways, you can just walk out there and get your pipes out without any trouble and move them to another part of the field. So it was, you know, really great in that regard. Um, there are um, things in terms of, like, I mean, we could have a long discussion about <laughs> crop selection and how to manage cover crops and all this stuff in a bed, permanent bed system, but I think that's another discussion time, which I'd be happy to have. Um, but um, there's two two other aspects that I think just need to be highlighted about um, some what might be um, benefits from living walkways. The one is this whole idea of just maintaining a diverse habitat throughout your planting fields that you don't get when you have clean tillage. Like you're either in dirt or you're in crops, which have a very limited rooting regimes. Like most annual crops are very minimal in their rooting um, regimes in the soil. So it's, you know, which doesn't benefit your soil long term. So by having this broad diversity going on all the time in your field, um, you know, the benefits to uh, beneficial insects and spider habitat and birds and uh, all these things like that are <clears throat> very helpful. The other thing that hasn't been looked at or we haven't talked about it is this, the possibility that we're maintaining soil microbial life on the edges of our growing beds that could and quite likely have the ability to be migrating into our planting beds that wouldn't normally be there from our annual vegetable cropping. So I think there's, you know, and like in my thinking about the ideal size of um, you know, the beds and the walkways and that thing. Um, I think David's four foot uh, planting bed is probably quite ideal in terms of being able to think about this issue of migration of soil microbes out of your walkways. You know, if I were starting a new farm, I'd never do a six-foot planting bed again. <laughs> I think f five feet is um, good, um, and it's mostly in terms of the, that human aspect, in terms of like reaching to the middle of a six-foot planting bed was a bit of a stretch. And I've seen four foot beds and, you know, it's quite easy. Five feet is, would be a compromise. The other thing about um, not doing a six foot and going to a five or four is that most modern tractors 
are easily adjusted to a five foot wheel track and quite easily done to a four foot wheel track. But for me going out to six feet, it was very complicated <laughs> with many of our tractors. You know, we had to use the services of, you know, competent welders, which I wasn't, and, you know, fabricators. But most tractors can be easily set up to handle a five-foot wheel track spacing. And I think in terms of this possibility of getting microbial life migrating in, I think five feet is, there would be some potential benefit there. That the the width isn't that wide. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think, I think with us, what we've seen, I've been doing some preliminary testing on microbial life in the pathways, but there's nothing. I mean, it's been two seasons, so I don't have a lot to report yet. Um, but I do, especially with things like creeping Charlie or um, what is it? it's not creeping Charlie, it's uh, purple nettle, is a weed that we have a lot of here. And it's a weed you don't, we get a lot over the winter. It grows really hard in the spring and it flowers really early. Um, bees love it. And I suspect that microbes absolutely love it because it's it's somewhat shallow. So it's right there in the warm. But when you pull the roots up, they are just saturated. Like they look the beautiful, big, beautiful um, rhizosheaths. And so like thinking about that microbial element in the pathways and cultivating those organisms that, aren't going to be as attracted to annual production, you know, or aren't going to be propagated as well in annual production as they will in perennial production. Um, I think those things are really, there's a lot of value there that we talk about, you know, not talk about enough when we talk about the above ground ecology, the bees and all the spiders and et cetera, that below ground ecology is definitely a part of it too. Um, anything else anyone wants to add before we, before we wrap this up? Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to add that actually we did um, some on-farm research, both looking at total microbial biomass, uh, well, actually three times, looking at total microbial biomass, then looking at mycorrhizae, and then the latest one was looking at, at long-term um, adding extra mulch or just adding the living mulches in terms of um, total microbial biomass. And, and we did find that just surface applying the residue uh, here at this Oregon farm, we saw an increase the first season and over three seasons, a significant increase uh, with adding that extra four inches of mulch as well as the the mowed and blowed living mulch. So that kind of surprised me, uh, just the surface application. Um, then with the total microbial biomass and the mycorrhizae, of course, where we did clean cultivation uh, had the, the lowest mycorrhizae, lowest total microbial biomass. Where we left the living mulches just to grow without any treatment at all, which was pretty ugly, it was pretty tall, uh, we actually had lower total microbial biomass. In other words, the, t the microbial community wanted to have that residue added on a regular basis. They wanted to have it mowed, which I found very interesting. And then perhaps what has really helped us set up this system with uh, shallow uh, tillage and maybe some of the uh, ripping is that when you compared no-till, that was the highest mycorrhizae. Um, when you had clean cultivation, significantly lower mycorrhizae. But there was this little sweet spot where you did the shallow um, up to two inch uh, tillage that we had, um, we had more mycorrhizae than where we did the, the clean cultivation. So that's kind of those, those three things that I've learned that, that mycorrhizae and total microbial biomass, the microbial community want to have fresh residues added on the surface without disturbance. 
and that they will put up, if you have a, a very diverse community, they will put up with a little bit of, of shallow tillage as long as, just what Lou said, you have an area from which they can migrate. I'd love to see more research than just my little on-farm research, but that to me is pretty exciting in, in helping us figure out how to develop systems. That is exciting. And Helen, I have a question about that experiment. So when you had the four inch mulch, mulch on the surface and you were getting more microbial biomass under that, how deep were you, sam were you taking that sample? So what I'm curious is, like, were the microbes concentrated right, right just in, at the soil surface, right under the mulch, or did that increased microbial activity go down a ways? I, we just did one sample and it was, um, you know, uh, all the samples were about six to eight inches. So uh, mm -hmm. it would have been interesting and significantly more expensive if we had been able to yeah, sample it at, exactly at uh, different depths. But we were basically doing yeah. soil tests uh, with our with our core and then we split the samples and did some microbial analysis and and then we actually sent the soil tests i shouldn't get on this but we sent it to two different labs our traditional lab that looked at traditional um nitrate nitrogen phosphate and then um and and typical percent organic matter loss on ignition versus organic forms of nutrients um, and microbial respiration carbon, and, and that was a whole nother thing. But I won't go there except to say mm -hmm. that less tillage, um, more of the um, uh, less soluble uh, nutrient levels in, in the beds. Well, one final comment I'd like to make. While, while we're talking about um, doing shallow tillage and as little tillage as possible, uh, I would like to mention that if you do choose to do tillage with some sort of powered machine, like be it a power harrow or rotivator, a spader, as well as going as, sh as shallowly as possible, run it at as slow an RPM as possible, because it, that is much kinder to the soil aggregates than running it fast. So on our rotivator, we got one with six times per flange as opposed to the standard four times per flange, which lets us run it a lot slower, but still do quite a, a thorough job. So when we are rotivating, we're basically l running the tractor at just a fast idle. So it takes a little longer to cover a bed, but you know you can look at the job afterwards and there's still tons of intact aggregates, which is what uh, we like to see. Yeah, that's going to maintain your soil organic matter a lot better if you're not breaking up those aggregates. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, that that discussion is, you know, has lots of nuances in it. I mean, in terms of, you know, when and how often and what you're doing with power tillage equipment. Um, I just make the comment that, you know, we're lacking in just a ton of research <laughs> into minimum tillage types of particularly vegetable operations. We just, there's so much stuff that doesn't get looked at and studied enough and techniques developed. It's, it's really a shame. And to do a proper proper trial, you know, controlled, adequately replicated and everything on farm as a farmer, it's really challenging because it's a lot of work. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we've had a couple of research grants on our farm uh, to do projects. And one of the things that really frustrated me is we could not charge for our labor doing the research, which to me was just insane. Yeah. So, that we, yeah. Fortunately, we we have an employee, and we could you know charge it to the to the employee's time when it wasn't. But yeah, it's it's just crazy that uh, 
you know, the, the time for many research projects, the time is the biggest expense of all. And if you can't get compensated for it, it just makes it that much harder to do. Well, I um I don't want to push our recording device here too too much longer, just in case. Um, but I I do want to thank you all so much for having this conversation. It just the the amount of insight, the amount of experience you all have shared and and given us has been incredible. So uh, to each of you, thank you so much for coming and, and chatting with us. Thank you. You you knew this was going to go over. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for the invite, Jesse. It's been a lot of fun and, you know, great to hear other folks' points of view. All right. I hope you all enjoyed that. If you'd like to carry on the conversation, go over to the forum at notillgoros.com and join in on the thread for this video. Uh, like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you're awesome. Also, if you like these videos and they bring you actual value, support them by buying a copy of the Living Soul Handbook at notillgoros.com or a hat or other merch, uh, join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash no-till growers, or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Okay. Thanks y'all. We'll see you later. Bye. And if you're wondering where my voice is, I, I left it at Acres this week. Yep. <laughs>